Hello again, Fulcrum Knights and those who are yet to join the Order. It is I, Harry, your reader, and I am returning to Star Wars Allegiance here for part 11 of our audiobook. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for all your patience while I've been away. I have a new microphone and a new setup, so I'm hoping that the audio quality of this episode will be particularly better than last time. Please leave a like on this video if you are enjoying the audiobook series, and if you want to come and hang out with us outside of YouTube, look in the description below for our Discord server. That's where we'll let you know when we're streaming, where you can come and hang out with us, and also just have a good time chatting. And now to the comments, so I can say hello and thank you to you wonderful supportive people. Ari, who commented a couple of videos ago, said, uh, Love your audiobooks. They really help me quell and keep anxiety at bay. I am so happy to hear that we're helping with that, Ari. Really, really happy to hear that. Ari also said, Voices are great. Could use some more variation with the female cast, lol. But I know those must be more difficult for you. Yes, yes, they are. Great job branching out with Leia's female boss's voice can't wait. Thank you again so much. Yes, um, having some more voice effects definitely helps with the alien characters. It can have a bit more variation in there. Thanks so much, as always, for your support and for listening. Skylar has commented saying, holy shit, my man ain't dead. Overjoyed to hear some more of the book. Thank you, Skylar. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not dead. Just, uh, just having to deal with a bunch of IRL stuff. And Ryan has commented saying, I had a laggy connection, so when you read the line, with five stormtroopers, it lagged in the middle and I heard, with fives, and I went on a short emotional roller coaster. What a great character Fives was. If Fives was helping out this rescue, it would be a cakewalk. It makes me think of the Bad Batch season finale, which is not yet out when commenting, and how I've got a bad feeling something's going to happen to Echo. Ooh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm fortunately, with all the IRL stuff I've had to do, I haven't been able to catch up on like any of the shows, so I don't know anything about Mando, I don't know anything about Bad Batch. I, uh, I really need to do some watching, but um, fortunately, got a lot of work still to do. But I'll catch up eventually. Thank you so much, my guys. For now, we will just get back to our good friends, the Hand of Judgment, also known as five stormtroopers who have defected from their Star Destroyer, and our good friends Han and Luke, who are currently searching for Leia on the planet Shelkon Wa, and to Mara Jade, who is fighting for her life alongside the Hand of Judgment against the ruthless Kaldra in an ATST. Let's see where all this goes. Chapter 20 continued. There were a dozen stormtroopers visible a block ahead, striding purposefully along the walkway, when Luke came to a sudden stop. What's wrong? Han demanded, his eyes on the Imperials. Nothing, Luke said. We're here. Han frowned, focusing for the first time on the dingy door and faded window menus beside him. A tap cafe? She's hiding here. You think maybe we can get inside? Luke pressed, nodding toward the approaching stormtroopers. Han shook his head. Her royal high-classness, hanging out in a place like this? Luke's mystic Jedi tricks must have popped a circuit breaker. Still, anywhere out of sight of stormtroopers was a good place to be. Pulling open the door, he stepped inside and came to a sudden, disbelieving stop. Across the murky dining room and the clumps of alien heads... He saw her. Not just sitting in a back corner, either, trying to hide with a hood over her head. She was on her feet, moving deftly through the crowded room, serving drinks. Her royal perfectness was actually dressed in a cover gown, serving drinks. There she is, Luke said excitedly. Yeah, I see her, Han said, giving the room another more careful look. There had been no abrupt silence or turned heads, but the air in the dining room had suddenly taken on a static charge. Everyone had spotted the new arrivals, and they didn't seem at all happy about it. Well? Luke asked impatiently. Han braced himself. Nice and easy, he muttered to the kid, keeping his hand as close to his blaster as he could without being obvious about it. He started threading his way between the tables. He was halfway there when a pair of Adarians in dusty workers' clothes stood up silently in front of him. Easy, Han soothed, holding up both hands, palms forward. 
Just dropped in to see a friend. Han? Leia called. Han looked between the two Adarians to see her coming toward him, surprise and relief on her face. We interrupting anything? He asked casually. I'm so glad you're here, she breathed, her eyes flicking past his shoulders to Luke. Both of you. How did you know I was in trouble? Never mind. We have to get out of here. Yeah, no kidding, Han said. This place got a back door? Yes, this way, Leia said, taking Han's arm. The two Adarians stepped aside and Leia led the way between the tables and into the kitchen. An orange-eyed mungren female was waiting by the back door. Safety and travel to you, Leia Organa, she rumbled. We will not forget you. Neither will I forget you, Vicria, Leia said, bowing her head to the other. Some day, when the slavery of the Empire is finally over, we'll buy you a drink, Han cut in. Taking Leia by the shoulders, he hustled her through the door. Beyond was an alley, narrow and poorly lit, and, for the moment anyway, deserted. Come on, he said, shifting his grip to Leia's arm and dragging her toward the alley's north end. Han, that was rude, she said accusingly. These people helped me hide. You want me to be standing there thanking her when Vader comes in the front door? Han interrupted. That'll make a good reading at her interrogation. Come on. Chewie's waiting at the spaceport. They were nearly to the end of the alley when Luke suddenly grabbed Han's arm. Behind us! Someone's coming! He hissed. Han glanced around. As far as he could see, the alley was still deserted. But the kid had been right way too many times on this trip for Han to start doubting him now. Over here, he said, drawing his blaster as he pulled Leia toward a stack of trash bins at the side of the alley. Pushing her behind them, he pressed himself against her to give himself some cover as he peered down the alley. Han, Leia began. Shh! Han, you're crushing me! Leia complained, the words sounding like they were coming out between clenched teeth. You want me to get shot? Han countered. There was something moving down there in the darkness now, coming up on them fast. They passed beneath a dim light. Scout troopers. Han muttered, feeling his stomach tighten. So that was the pattern of the day. The main body of stormtroopers searching the buildings from the main streets, scout troopers on speeder bikes patrolling the back alleys watching for runners, neat and clean and personnel efficient. And Han had about 30 seconds to figure out how to take them out. At his side, Leia was pushing against his shoulder. Stay put, he growled, looking around for inspiration. There was no other cover he and the others might get to, certainly nothing that would really hide them. Which meant he would have to shoot the Imperials. Problem was, while he could probably take out about one target from ambush without trouble, the second wasn't going to obligingly sit still for his next shot. But he was just going to have to risk it. From somewhere, in the near distance, a sudden volley of blaster fire drifted across the quiet night air. Setting his teeth, Han lifted his blaster and lined it up on the first scout trooper. With a final push, Leia shoved her way between him and the trash bins. What the crink are you doing? He demanded quietly. Give me your blaster, she ordered, looking out at the approaching scout troopers. Look, your worship. Without another word, she reached over and twisted the blaster from his hand. Han started to snatch it back, but she evaded his grasp, pushing him away with her elbow. He looked at Luke, but the kid was frowning down the alley toward the approaching scout troopers, his forehead creased in concentration. The distant blaster fire seemed to be getting worse, and Han saw the two scout troopers glance at each other across their speeders and accelerate. Leia fired. Not at either of the troopers, but up along the side of the building across the alley. Han looked up, frowning, and to his surprise saw a 20-metre length of drain pipe lean ponderously out from the wall four floors up. With a splintering crack, it broke free and tumbled toward the alley below. It hit the permacrete in front of the speeder bikes and bounced up just in time to catch both troopers squarely across their faceplates. They flipped backwards off the speeders, one of them slamming flat onto the ground, the other managing another quarter rotation before joining him. 
the speeder bikes, now riderless, coasted to a hovering halt. The scout troopers themselves didn't move at all. Let's go, Leia said, thrusting the blaster back into Han's hands. Which spaceport did you say you were at? Greencliff, Han said, giving the troopers and the mostly shattered drain pipe a final puzzled look. Someday, he would have to ask Leia how she'd pulled that one off. Well, come on then, she repeated impatiently, grabbing at his arm. Before they miss these two. Hang on a second, said Han, eyeing the idling speeder bikes. It was risky, he knew. Civilians on military speeders would absolutely catch the eye of any roaming stormtroopers. But the time value might just be worth it, at least for a few blocks. You ever ride one of these things? He asked, nudging her toward the nearest bike. No, Leia said warily. Han, I don't think... No, he's right, we can do it, Luke said. He went over to one of the bikes and gingerly climbed on. Okay, Leia said clearly still not convinced. But I'm driving. You said you'd never done it before, Han reminded her. Have you? She counted. Well, not the military versions. Then I'm driving, she concluded. Besides, you need your blaster hand free in case we run into trouble. Han made a face. Female logic. Still, she had a point. Drainpipe sharpshooter skills notwithstanding, he was still a better shot than she was, especially on the fly. Absolutely, your worshipfulness, he said. Get on. They climbed onto the other speeder, Leia taking the saddle, while Han balanced himself on the emergency gear storage bag behind her. He wrapped his left arm around her waist, noting with private amusement that she squirmed a little at his touch. This might turn out better than he'd thought. It took her and Luke a minute to figure out the controls, and the first 20 metres were pretty jerky going as they tried to fine-tune the throttle settings. But after that, both of them seemed to get the hang of it, and they were off, sticking to the back alleys. Fortunately, the other scout trooper patrols didn't seem to have gotten this far north yet. Or else, all the stormtroopers in the area had suddenly found more important things to worry about than a rebel fugitive. The blaster fire coming from the northwest had intensified, with several different models of weapon in play. A major battle was taking place over there, right at the spot where Larone had kicked him and Luke out of the speeder truck. But if the stormtroopers were in trouble, they were on their own, at least for the moment. Maybe once he and Luke had Leia safely aboard the Suantec, they could come back and find out what was going on. They'd made it about three blocks, and Luke and Leia were finally settling into a decent ride rhythm, when out of the corner of his eye, Han spotted something flying south just above the rooftop level to the west. He looked up. Stop! He barked, squeezing Leia tighter around her waist. Luke! What is it? Leia called over her shoulder as she braked to a halt. That's our ship, Han told her, pointing toward the spot where the Suantec had vanished over the cityscape. What? Luke asked, sounding stunned. Where? Where are all the blaster fires coming from, Han said grimly. Chewie's headed straight into the middle of it. That doesn't sound good, Luke said. No kidding. Han snarled, yanking out his comlink and thumbing it on, only to instantly shut it off again at the burst of static that erupted. They're jamming everything, he bit out, shoving the comlink back into his belt and pointing ahead at the next cross street. Come on, that way. We need to head them off. Right, Leia said, turning the speeder in that direction. Luke was already on the move, heading toward the cross street. Han grimaced, hanging on tightly as Leia rounded the turn and kicked the speeder bike to full speed. It was Larone and his friends in trouble, all right. He'd bet the Falcon's starboard cargo bay on that. And so naturally, Chewie was there too, charging to the rescue. If they got out of this one alive, he promised himself darkly he and Chewie were going to have a long talk about this sort of thing. A very long talk. 
The scout trooper took off down the street, weaving his sluggishly evasive path as his underslung blaster spit defiant and useless fire at the approaching ATST. Mara crouched close behind her burning freighter, blinking against the smoke swirling around her as she mentally crossed her fingers. The ATST's chin blaster cannons depressed to track toward the trooper, and for a moment she thought Caldra was going to fall for it. But then the cannons lifted again, and the side-mounted light cannon turret swiveled around and opened fire. The trooper swerved around the blasts, ducked between the two huge jointed legs, and shot out the other side. The side turret swiveled around, continuing to lay down fire. As the scout veered to Mara's left, out of the turret's range, the launcher on the ATST's other side hurled a concussion grenade at him. The grenade hit the permacrete with an explosion that shattered half a block's worth of windows and slammed across Mara's face like a velvety hammer. She peered through the smoke, tensing. But as the air cleared, she saw the scout trooper, still on his speeder, disappear around a building and down a side street. Safe? or at least not seriously injured, and coming around for another try. The other stormtroopers were meanwhile not standing idle, but had settled into a rhythmic fire pattern that was pouring a withering barrage at the ATST's joints and sensor clusters and viewports. But the walker had been designed for exactly this kind of combat, and it shrugged off the fire with ease. Indeed, it almost seemed that Caldra was enjoying the battle, especially the one-sidedness of it. Instead of throttling the ATST for top speed, which would have quickly run down his opponents, he had the walker moving almost casually along, daring his opponents to take their best shot. There was a motion at her side, and Mara saw the squad commander drop into a crouch beside her. I ordered you to fall back, she said. I need to consult, he said tightly. I think we may have a way to knock him out. Explain. The gyro system is layered between the underside of the command module and the leg platform, the commander said. If I can get my sniper up into one of the buildings ahead of it, he may be able to get a clean shot. Mara looked back down the street behind the retreating stormtroopers. Yes, there were several buildings back there that should work. The problem was that the sniper would get exactly one shot. If he missed, or if the gyro was tough enough to survive the attack, Calder would simply swivel the command module around and blow both him and the building to rubble. Which the commander and sniper both knew full well. Get him up, Mara ordered. Let's hope we won't have to use him. Right. The commander gathered his feet beneath him, preparing for a sprint. But before he could move, something suddenly roared past overhead. Fire from the ATST's entire array of blaster cannons spattering across its underside. Reflexively, Mara ducked, her eyes tracking the intruder. Had Vader's scattered searchers finally decided to investigate all the noise coming from this end of town? Only, it wasn't a stormtrooper transport up there. In fact, it wasn't an imperial vehicle of any sort. It was some kind of freighter, its features blurred by the smoke and darkness and its own speed. Even as she watched, it veered around and came back again, slowing down on its repulsor lifts, as if studying the extraordinary street scene below. Get him out of here, Mara ordered. The comms are being jammed, the commander reminded her. I know that, Mara snapped. Wave him off, then do something. He's a sitting avian up there. I'll try. The commander stood up and lifted his hands high. And at that moment, there was a multiple flicker of blaster fire from somewhere behind the ATST. Luke arrived at the main street and wobbled his speeder bike to a halt at the edge of the building on the corner. Leia stopped behind him and Han jumped off, running the last couple of metres. Blasters ready, he peered around the corner. Less than half a block away was an Imperial ATST, its back to them, striding ponderously southward down the street. A block beyond it was some kind of smoking wreckage, probably the freighter he and the others had seen being shot down. Through the billowing smoke, he could see someone standing up in plain sight, apparently unaware of the approaching walker. 
while beyond him, some even vaguer figures seemed to be firing at the ATST, and wheeling around over their heads, looking for all the world like it was thinking about ramming the walker, was Chewbacca in Larone's Suantec. I guess they're more serious than I thought, Leia said tightly from his side. Believe it, Han told her, his mind racing. If he could just warn Chewie off somehow, maybe get him to go back to the spaceport, but with all the comlinks being jammed. He looked back at the ATST, at the gap between the command module and the leg assembly. If the technical readouts he'd seen were correct, that was where all the antennas were located, including those that handled comm jamming. It was worth a try. Lining his blaster up on the gap, he opened fire. Wave him off, then do something, the Emperor's hand ordered. He's a sitting avian up there. I'll try, Larone said, standing up. Don't fire, he pleaded silently as he waved his arms in an effort to get Chewbacca's attention. Please don't fire. With the upgrades the ISB had loaded onto the Suantec's weapon system, a single twin burst could probably blow the ATST to shredded metal. Unfortunately, it would also cut straight through the protective armoring on the high intensity power cells and turn the ATST into a fireball that would take out the stormtroopers, most of the buildings on this block, and possibly the Suantec itself along with it. Fortunately, Chewbacca seemed to understand that. He was still flying around, but there was no indication that he had even activated the Suantec's laser cannons. Larone waved his arms again, trying to get him to pull back. Then, inexplicably, the low-level static coming from his comlink abruptly vanished. We have com, he called to the young woman beside him. Someone's taken out the ATST's jamming, she said. Now warn him off. Larone nodded and keyed his comlink to their private frequency. Chewbacca, this is Larone, he said, lowering his voice. You need to get out of here. We can handle this. Apparently, he hadn't lowered it enough. You know that pilot? The Emperor's hand demanded. He's associated with us, Larone improvised. I've told him to go back to the spaceport. Good. No, wait a minute, the young woman said. She looked back at the approaching walker, an intense expression on her face. What kind of armor does that ship have? Reasonably strong, Larone told her, wondering uneasily what she had in mind. The minute the Suantec went into serious combat, she would surely see it for the disguised special ops craft that it was. Ten minutes after that, he and the others would be in custody pending an inquiry. An hour after the inquiry was finished, they would be in ISB hands. Good, because it's going to have to take a little more fire, the woman said. Here's the new plan. Larone wants you to do what? Han demanded into his comlink, watching as the Suantec made a wide curve toward the west, as if starting to head back toward Greencliff. That's crazy. Chewbacca rumbled an answer. Yeah, and he's crazy too, Han growled. What's he doing? Luke asked. Who's Larone? Leia added. We don't exactly know who Larone is, Han said grimly. And he wants Chewie to be some kind of bait. For an ATST? Leia asked, sounding stunned. Don't worry. That ship's tougher than it looks, Han said. That's not the problem. The problem is that now that the jamming's gone, this place is going to be crawling with Imperials pretty soon. Then shouldn't we go? Luke prompted. Go where? Han retorted. Back to the spaceport and pretend we're just shopping? That's our ride up there, remember? That's our ride? Leia put in. What happened to the Falcon? There he goes, Luke said before Han could answer. The Suantec was on the move all right, turning back over the street behind the stormtroopers. Dropping its nose, it threw a power to its drive and charged straight for the oncoming ATST. Mara was crouched on the back of the speeder bike, gazing down the narrow alley at the street half a block away, 
when she heard the scout trooper's muffled comlink acknowledgement. Silently, she counted down the seconds, getting a solid grip on his shoulders as she hunched down behind him. And, as her mental count reached zero, he revved the speeder and they were off. Mara squinted against the sudden wind rushing across her face, holding tightly to the edges of the trooper's breastplate. Somewhere ahead and to the right, the ATST was still coming, but with her view blocked by the building beside her, she couldn't see either it or the freighter that was supposedly now flying straight toward it. The squad commander out there was calling the numbers, and Mara could only trust that he knew what he was doing. The speeder was coming up to the end of the alley. Directly in front of her, she caught a blurred glimpse of the freighter as it shot past, climbing for altitude. Over the roar of its drive, she heard the ATST open fire, saw one of its thick, pad feet hit the permacrete directly in front of them. The speeder shot out of the alley, and Mara saw that the gamble had worked. Caldra had pulled out all the stops as the intruder shot past overhead, his chin blasters elevated as high as they could go, the light blaster turret on his left side swivelled up, all the weapons firing at full power. It was the logical response to a large and unclassified attacker. More to the point, it was exactly the same response Caldra had shown the first time the freighter had overflown him. Only, what he seemed to have forgotten was with all his weapons pointed upward, the ground at his feet was now unprotected. With exquisite skill, the scout trooper sent his speeder bike straight across the ATST's path, bare centimetres in front of its next step. As they paused in front of the walker, Mara jumped. Her outstretched hands caught the base of the chin blasters just in front of their housing, her momentum swinging her completely around the weapons and landing her in another crouch on the precarious footing of the housing itself. Pushing off, she jumped again, this time to the top of the command module. With one hand gripping the entry hatch handrail for balance, she drew and ignited her lightsaber with her other hand and slashed sideways through the heavy armour, cutting directly through the cockpit's twin seats. Nothing happened. For a moment, she continued to kneel on top of the hatch, her mind frozen as the walker continued striding down the street. It was impossible. An ATST's cockpit was nearly as tight as that of a TIE fighter. There was no way she could have missed the pilot. Unless there wasn't one. And then it all fell into place. Swearing under her breath, she stepped back onto the grafting of the cockpit cooling system and jabbed her lightsaber blade through the entry hatch's locking mechanism. Closing down the weapon, she pulled the hatch open. The cockpit was empty. She slid feet first through the narrow opening and manoeuvred her way through the cramped space into the pilot's seat. The auto-guide and sentry mode sections of the control board glowed a cheerful green. Scowling, Mara shut them both down. The ponderous, rolling motion stopped as the ATST finally came to a halt, the blaster cannons depressing to their off positions. For another moment, Mara sat where she was, glowering at the controls, feeling like a complete fool. An ATST's computer could easily handle the uncomplicated terrain of a city street, while its sentry mode could, and would, track and fire at anything that came too close without a properly coded transponder. All Caldra had to do was to get the machine pointed in the right direction, make sure it was travelling slowly enough that Mara would decide she had a chance of stopping it, and then disappear into the night. The Emperor would be furious. Vader would never let her hear the end of it. She took a deep breath, forcing away the images. Neither of them needed to hear about her failure because she hadn't yet failed. The ATST's computer might be competent enough to handle a nice, simple city street, but it wasn't nearly sophisticated enough to manoeuvre itself out of the hole Caldra had blown into the Happer's Way cargo bay. That meant Calder had been with it once, and therefore had been at the Greencliff spaceport, which meant he couldn't be that far ahead of her. More to the point, she knew where he was going. She would just have to get there first. The stream of orders and reports suddenly coming over the general comm frequency had been Lerone's first indication that the Imperial searchers in the area were finally responding. 
but even he wasn't prepared at how quickly the street began to fill up with stormtroopers. Most of them went for the now quiescent ATST, while a few headed toward the Suantec, which had settled down on the street a block north, with its nose pointed toward the ATST and its left side pressed against the row of buildings. Some of them, far too many, were coming straight for Larone and his companions. A group commander strode ahead of the latter bunch, his faceplate turning to each of the five in turn before settling on Larone. You he said briskly. Identify and report. The ATST was stolen and on a rampage, Lerone said, gesturing toward it. My squad was commandeered to help bring it down. Commandeered by whom? The group commander demanded. Commandeered by me, a voice called from above them. Lerone looked up to see the Emperor's hand climbing nimbly down the side of the ATST, her lightsaber now tucked discreetly away in her belt. And you are? The group commander challenged. An imperial agent, the young woman said as she dropped the last three meters to the permacrete. Recognition code, Hapspear Barini. The group commander seemed to straighten a little. Yes, ma'am, he said, his voice suddenly parade ground formal. Lord Vader informed us of your presence in Macrin City. He gestured to Larone. Are these men with you? For the moment, she said. Why? I need their unit designation for my report. I don't know their designation, the hand said. I also don't care, she gestured to Lerone. Give the freighter pilot my thanks and tell him he can return to the spaceport. You, Scout, is that thing still functional? Yes, ma'am, as long as you don't need anything tricky, Brightwater assured her. Then get ready to travel, she said. The rest of you back into your speeder truck. Just a moment, ma'am the group commander said, starting to sound a little flustered. Vader was rumoured to be a stickler for proper procedure, and this wasn't even coming close. That freighter needs to be searched before it can leave. You can search it at the spaceport, the Emperor's hand told him. I don't want it sitting here blocking the street. Ma'am? You have your orders, group commander. She cut off the protest, her eyes on Larone. Commander? Yes, ma'am, Larone said a cold feeling settling into him as he keyed his comm for their private frequency. The hand hadn't noticed it. She'd been in the ATST cockpit at the time, but just as Chewbacca had settled the Suantec onto the permacrete, its port side ramp had lowered into the mouth of the alley the ship was currently pressed up against. From his angle and distance, Lerone hadn't been able to see if anyone had gone aboard, but the Wookiee's carefully casual positioning was way too precise to be an accident. Solo and Luke were almost certainly back aboard, probably with their missing friend in tow. And if the 501st searchers found them... But there was nothing he could do but obey his orders. Pilot, you're cleared to return to Greencliff Spaceport he called, trying to sound authoritatively casual. Thanks for your assistance. He tensed, wondering if the Wookiee's growl response would be loud enough for the others to hear through his helmet. But... Got it. Solo's voice came instead. Call us any time. Always glad to help. With a slight wobble, the Suantec lifted from the permacrete, rotated 180 degrees, and headed back toward the spaceport. He acknowledges and says they were glad to help, Lerone relayed. Good, the Emperor's hand said. Now get in that truck. After you identify your unit, the group commander put in, taking a step to put himself between Lerone and the speeder truck. His arms shifted position, bringing his E-11 from its cross-chest rest position to hip aim, pointed at Lerone. Lerone grimaced. So, this is how it ends flickered through his mind. Not in glorious battle against some enemy of the Empire, but in quiet shame. All because he'd seen an air vehicle going down and made the decision to try and help. Then, to his astonishment, the Emperor's hand stepped between him and the leveled blaster. They're with me, she said, her voice calm but edged with permafrost. 
Their assignment is to be with me. Their unit designation is as assistance to me. Their authorization comes from me. Are there any other questions? Mom. I said, are there any other questions? The group commander's chest plate shifted as he took a deep breath. No, ma'am, he said, bringing his blaster back to rest position. Good, the woman said. Lord Vader told me not to interfere with your search. You'd best get on with it. Yes, ma'am. With a final look at Larone, the commander turned and strode off. The young woman watched him the first few steps, then turned back to Larone. In the truck, she said tartly, first stops the spaceport. A minute later, they were heading north, Larone at the controls. Where exactly in the spaceport, ma'am? He asked. A freighter called the Happer's Way, she said. It's where the rogue ATST came from. You think the thief went back there? It's possible, but I doubt it, she said. Mostly, I want to lock it down to make sure he can't get out that way. I also need to collect some items I left aboard. Larone frowned. She'd left items aboard the thief's ship? I see, he said, wishing he actually did. After that, the woman added, we're heading for the governor's palace. Larone felt his muscles tighten. The palace? he asked carefully. Yes, she said. You have a problem with that? Larone threw a sideways look at Marcross, seated beside him. Even through the armour, he could sense the other's unnatural stiffness. No, ma'am, Larone said. My unit's at your complete disposal. Yes, she said softly. I know. And we come to the end of chapter 20. A really good one. Full of action and full of some payoffs to all of the things that we've seen. All of these different parts are finally coming together. We've had Luke and Solo finally meeting up with Leia. We've also had them hanging out with Larone and Larone and his guys meeting up with Mara. I don't think we're going to see any Luke and Mara connection in this story, but as we know from Legends, it does happen elsewhere. Let me know how you felt about that one. One thing I have to say about that chapter, it makes the ATSTs seem way cooler and also, unfortunately, does make the whole Ewoks taking them down seem even more unrealistic. I think with some of the things that Zahn says about the ATSTs, like how essentially when you're in there, there you have so much like sensor coverage that you can see in like a 360 view and you know what's around you. It, it does make it feel a little bit um, harder to believe that um, some Care Bears took it down with sticks. But hey, I still love that movie, man. And as we all know, uh, Star Wars and Lucasfilm and uh, Disney now don't seem to really care about what Legends says about the canon and the law. So I guess the law is ATSTs, they are vulnerable to Ewoks. That's it. Moving on to some comments before we go on to the next chapter, Jack has come in and left a message saying, Been wondering who would win in a 1v1 battle, the Death Star or the Doomsday Machine, a planet killer from Star Trek, would love your opinion. Now, I have to admit to you, Jack, uh, I don't know much about the Doomsday Machine. Uh, for what I can see, it's an original series episode, and I have to admit, I really have not watched the original series. I'm more of a next-gen guy, and overall, I'm very much a Deep Space Nine guy. I got really into that one, so uh, sorry that I can't um, give you an answer myself. But I am sure that my good friends here in YouTube have their own opinions and plenty to say. So, my friends, please get in the comments and start telling me what you think about that question. I think it's a good one. And Jay in the comments says, I've been listening to some John le Carre radio plays, and I've got to say that your Yank accent is a lot more believable than those others. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that very much so. Also, that sounds really interesting. Uh, the John le Carre radio play sounds super cool. Um, where are you listening to those? And Madigan87 says, So glad to have this story and hear your amazing voice again, Harry. Thank you. Thank you so much for, again, just being so kind and welcoming now that I've been able to come back. Speaking of back, let's get back to reading. Now we're on to chapter 21, my friends. Caldra had not, as it turned out, returned to the Happer's Way in Mara's absence. 
Still, there was no way to know that going in, and there was also no point in taking unnecessary chances. Mara took four of the stormtroopers in with her, sending them out in pairs to search the freighter, leaving the scout trooper outside on guard duty. Her satchel was exactly where she'd left it, seemingly untouched. But only seemingly. Caldra had left most of her equipment alone, but had apparently spent a pleasant hour on the way back from Geperin gimmicking her grenades and the tiny holdout sleeve blaster. Leaving those items untouched, Mara changed once again into her black combat suit, this time adding the cloak and sleeves for extra protection against prying eyes, targeting sensors, and the dropping air temperatures outside. She fastened her hip-riding K-14 blaster in place, tucked her lightsaber into her belt, and headed back outside. Ten minutes after arriving at the freighter, they were on the road again, heading west along a deserted tree-lined street toward the palace. You know where we're going? Mara called from the rear seat. She'd made a subtle point of creating this seating arrangement when they'd reassembled for the trip. Mara in the back alone, the other stormtroopers seated two by two in rows in front of her. As usual, the scout trooper ran point on his speeder bike. We have a map already loaded, the squad commander confirmed from the driver's seat, pointing to the display. It has the best route marked. Excellent, Mara said. Drawing her lightsaber, she rested the hilt on the seat back in front of her, pointing the weapon forward. As long as we have a few minutes anyway, let's hear your story. One of the stormtroopers in the seat in front of her half turned his head. Excuse me? He asked. His right shoulder shifted subtly, indicating a movement of his hand toward his holstered E-11. With a sigh, Mara ignited her lightsaber. The magenta blade snap-hissed into existence, running down the centre of the truck between the two sets of white helmets. Just leave your weapons where they are, she advised, in case having a lightsaber blade 30 centimetres from their necks wasn't enough of a hint. We'll start with your operating numbers, your unit designation and your current assignment. All the things you tried so hard to avoid telling the group commander back there. Four helmets tilted as the stormtroopers exchanged glances across the blade. Shy, are we? Mara went on conversationally. Let me get the ball rolling. You and your freighter, your freighter, not something belonging to some vague friend or associate, were on Geperin in the aftermath of the reprisal's attack on the Bloodscar base. I saw you sitting on the last intact pad when I took off from the Commodore's emergency bolt hole. All of this sounding familiar? Yes, ma'am, it is, the squad commander said, his voice tight. But we weren't part of the attack. I know that, Mara said. If you were, you'd have attacked or at least challenged me as I headed out. So... Why were you there? We were tracking the blood scars, the commander said. We had evidence that they'd been gathering other criminal organizations in the sector into a single massive pirate group. We went to Geperin hoping to find out who, if anyone, was funding the operation. And did you? His helmet shifted as he gave his seat partner a sideways glance. We think so, yes. Good. Mara said. Because so did I. Whose authority are you operating under? We don't actually... His voice trailed away. If you're worried about my clearance, don't be, Mara assured him. I'm about as high in the ranks as you can get, even if I'm not on anyone's official list. She raised her eyebrows. I take it you're not on any official lists either? No, we're not the commander confirmed. So, what's your unit designation? He hesitated. Mostly we're known as the Hand of Judgment. Mara cocked an eyebrow. Sounds a little too poetic for Stormtrooper Command, she commented. And way too poetic for ISB. We chose it ourselves, actually, one of the others put in. And we're not allowed to reveal anything more. The commander continued. I'm sorry. Mara pursed her lips. 
She could force the issue, of course. But with Governor Chord presumably alerted to her presence, it would be difficult and dangerous to try to break into his compound alone. This hand of judgment hadn't attacked her as she'd departed Geperin. More significantly, they'd come to her aid after Caldra's gimmicked ATST had shot her down. And, with Vader and the 501st completely preoccupied with their search for Leia Organa, this was the most trustworthy help she was likely to find in McCrin City. Reason enough for her to have fended off that nosy group commander. As you wish, she said. But whatever your usual chain of command or a lack of one, for the next two hours you're working for me, understood? Yes, ma'am, the commander said. Good, Mara said. Closing down the lightsaber, she returned it to her belt. What are your operating numbers? We usually just use names, the commander said. It's shorter, quicker in combat. Privately, Mara had always thought that too, but Stormtrooper Command had always loved their fancy number system. Names, then? I'm Larone. The commander gestured to his right. This is Marcross. Behind him is Grave. Behind me is Quilla. Our scout trooper is Brightwater. Call me Jade, Mara told them, stretching out with the force. She'd never heard of a stormtrooper unit roaming the Empire without a firm chain of command attached. But it could be something the Emperor had set up personally. If he had, they might recognise her name. There was no reaction that she could sense. However, apparently, the Emperor had chosen to keep her secret from them, as well as vice versa. Ma'am? Grave asked. Jade. Uh, Jade? The other corrected. May I ask uh, what the plan is once we reach the palace? The plan is for me to break in and for you to help me do it, Mara said. That's all you need to know. Yes, ma'am, Grave said. And be ready for some opposition, Mara added. I expect we're going to find some. In the front seat, Marcross glanced sideways at Larone. Don't worry, he said, his voice grim. We're ready. Governor Chord's hastily organised party in the ballroom downstairs had taken up far too much of Dizra's precious time this evening. But the guests were finally starting to filter out, and Disra was at last able to slip away to his office. Turning on the lights, he sealed the door behind him and headed for his desk. He got three steps before his eyes abruptly registered the fact that he had a visitor. Why aren't you answering your comm link? Caldra demanded as he looked up from Disra's computer. Disra felt his heart seize up. What in blazes was Caldra doing with his computer? The governor threw together a quick reception this evening, he managed. I had to put in an appearance. A reception? Calder repeated. A party? Now? When your city's crawling with stormtroopers, that's exactly what you need to soothe all the top-tier people, Disra said. Unlocking his knees, he started casually toward the desk. There was a holdout blaster hidden under the chair if he could get to it. What are you doing here? Calder's face twisted in an almost smile. And for the first time, Disra noticed the rigidly controlled pain lurking behind the other's eyes. I brought your ATSTs, of course. I meant, what are you doing here in this office? Disra clarified, stepping up to the desk. From his new vantage point, he could see Caldra's torn left sleeve and the rough field bandage wrapped around his forearm. What happened? Small accident. Caldra said, lifting the arm slightly. I had to blow the freighter's hold. His lips twisted. I suppose you didn't hear anything about that, either. I haven't heard any news since you hauled me out of the reception earlier to get you your palace landing clearance, Disra gritted. At the time, he'd thought it more important to be present and visible at Chord's stupid party than to monitor Caldra's unexpected arrival. In retrospect, it looked like he'd been wrong. Fill me in. Well, first of all, 
Our Imperial agent somehow managed to get herself unstranded, Caldra said. She's here, in McCrin City. An icy shiver ran up Disra's back. You said you'd gimmick the last functional ship left on Geperin. Yeah, apparently not well enough, Caldra said. Ten minutes after I landed the green cliff, she put down not three slots over. You mean she followed you here? Caldra cocked his head. If we're lucky. Disra snorted. You have a strange definition of luck. No, I just have a few new facts, Caldra said. On the trip from Geperin, I was finally able to get through to one of the crew as I know aboard the reprisal. It now seems like that Ozel's attack on the Bloodscar's base had nothing to do with us. I thought the Imperials didn't go after pirates these days. They do when the attack can serve as a convenient cover for something else, Caldra said grimly. A lot of this is still at the unfiltered rumor level, but it appears that our Imperial agent may have seen something in the reprisal's files that she wasn't supposed to know about and that Ozel followed her to Geperin to shut her up. You're joking, Disra said, staring at him. What did she see? Officially, it was something about a secret ISB operation that some of the reprisal stormtroopers were co-opted for. Caldra cocked an eyebrow. Unofficially, rumor has it those stormtroopers ain't on any mission, but they murdered an ISB officer and deserted. Disra goggled. Impossible, he insisted. Stormtroopers don't desert ever. They didn't used to, Caldra agreed. But who knows? Rot spreads from the top, and Imperial Center these days is about as fetid as you can get. He waved a hand around him. Hence this whole bid for independence, remember? Yes, thank you, I do recall something about that. Disra said acidly, his mind racing. But if the agent wasn't after them... Wait a minute. How many stormtroopers were supposed to have deserted? Very good, Caldra said, inclining his head. There were five of them. The same number that the follow-up reports from Ranklage indicate were on hand when Cav Saran went down. Considerably fewer than the three squads the Bargleg Swoop Gang claimed attacked them on Drunost, Disra recalled. But since when could a bunch of swoopers be trusted for accuracy? So they're the rogue stormtrooper unit running around Shosha. Our so-called Hand of Judgment, Caldra agreed. All rather ironic, really. We've been all worried about an Imperial agent and her private stormtrooper squad when, in fact, if she ever actually came across them, she'd probably execute all five of them on the spot. Comforting to know, Disra growled. Or it might be if she wasn't nosing around on our doorstep. Caldra shook his head. You're missing the point. It's the stormtroopers who've been backtracking the blood scars, not her. There's no longer any reason to assume she's made any connection at all between us and the blood scars. Disra thought about that. It did indeed sound reasonable. But you said she'd followed you here. All she knows is that I was with the Commodore at Geperin, Caldra said. I guess it's just as well that an idiot controller on the Executor wouldn't let me land here at the palace. Disra exhaled in relief. So the agent wasn't gunning for them after all. The whole thing had been a giant coincidence that he and Caldra had simply misread. Then we're probably off the hook, he said. Probably, Caldra said. But it's always possible she found something in the Geperin rubble that points in this direction. We need to be ready, just in case. Disra shivered. Yes, indeed. Because if the agent made an appearance before Disra was able to get those records to Vader, he would be going down in flames. Any idea how soon we might expect her? He asked. Caldra shrugged. I left her a diversion, but there's no way of knowing how long that'll keep her busy. He waved at the computer. I've raised the security level on your external intruder defenses, but I can't restructure your guard configuration without authority. I can do that. 
Distra said, gesturing for him to move aside. Will that be enough to stop her? Not if she's on the hunt, Caldra said, climbing out of the chair and stepping away from the desk. Which means we need to make our move. He raised his eyebrows. And we need to make it now. Disra stared at him. Are you insane? Declare independence with Vader and the 501st right here in the city? If we do it right, they'll have more immediate matters to worry about than you or me, Caldra said. I've already ordered the pirate and raider groups into their positions. All you have to do is send out the orders. And within minutes or hours, Shelsha Sector would be engulfed in fire and war and death. The pirates would attack and destroy the Imperial garrisons. The raiders would seize and hold critical military equipment plants, and the swoop gangs and carefully placed moles would take major cities and major Imperial officials hostage. The Declaration of Independence would be made, and Imperial Center would be dared to do something about it. And there would be no going back. I can make the calls, Disra said carefully as he activated the comm panel. But it's going to take time. You'll need to make sure the agent doesn't get in here until I'm done. I can do that, Caldra confirmed grimly. You just worry about your end. Turning his back, he headed for the secret door. Disra watched him go, his hand itching to draw the hidden blaster and shoot Caldra down. But he didn't dare. He still had to collect those records and get them to Vader, and he had no illusions about the palace guard's ability to keep the approaching Imperial agent away that long. Only Caldra could do that. Besides, if he shot at the man now, he might miss. By the way, he called, does anyone know where this hand of judgment is now? Caldra shook his head. Out somewhere being white knights for hope and glory, no doubt, he said. Don't worry. When Gepperin went, so too did their last hope of pinning us to the blood scars. He opened the door and disappeared into the maze of secret passages beyond. Let's hope so. Disra muttered under his breath as he turned back to his desk and switched off his comm panel. No messages were going out to any pirates tonight, not from this palace. Not if he could help it. Keying the computer, he got back to his records compilation. Ironic, Caldra had called it. Little did he know, for nearly two years now, Disra had been manipulating the man, jumping him through hoops only Disra could see. Now, suddenly, events had effectively pushed Disra to the sidelines, with his life and future resting completely on Caldra's ability to intercept and destroy an Imperial agent. Disra could only hope the man was as good as he claimed. They were still five blocks from the palace grounds when Larone began to notice the disguised sentries. Actually, I think there was one even further back, Graves said, when Larone commented. A couple of blocks ago. It was a little hard to tell. He was rigged out to look like a low-class slithmonger. Yes, he was a sentry, Jade confirmed from the back seat. I could see it in his eyes. Do Imperial governors typically set this wide a picket screen? Quilla asked. Not usually, Jade said. Looks like someone in the palace has a guilty conscience. So what do we do about him? Grave asked as they passed another of the quiet sentries. Nothing, Jade said. All they're seeing here is a few more stormtroopers in a city already full of them. I doubt they'll even bother to call it in. We'll need more than just familiar armor to get through the front gate, though, Quilla warned. Fortunately, we're not going in that way, Jade said. The governor has built himself quite an estate over the years, with lots of ground and plenty of nooks and crannies. We'll find our way in. Though the perimeter walls probably rigged six ways from Imperial Center, Grave warned. Maybe even seven or eight, Jade agreed. Don't worry, I've had some experience with these things. Beside Larone, Marcross stirred. There's another way, he said quietly. We can use the governor's emergency exit. 
Lerone looked at him in surprise. He has an emergency exit. All governors and moths do, Jade said, with a touch of contempt. How do you know about it, Marcross? I grew up in McCrin City, Marcross said. I used to hang out with Chord's son, Craig, when we were teenagers. The exit's in the northeast side of the wall, at the edge of the Farfarn district, one of the city's working-class neighbourhoods. There's a door-sized section of the wall that opens up. And Chord just let the two of you wander in and out? Quiller asked. I don't think he ever knew we were doing it, Mark Ross said. It's pretty far from all the security of the main gate, and it leads into the edge of one of his garden areas. Mostly pools and fountains and trees, with lots of flagstones so you don't leave any footprints. Craig used to sneak out at night and hit all the clubs and cantinas. How did you deflect the security tags? Jade asked. It wasn't tagged, Mark Ross said. I think Chord was as worried about his own guards turning on him as he was about trouble from outside. He didn't want anyone inside knowing about the exit. You do need a passkey to open it, though. Not a problem, Jade assured him. Let's take a look. Marcross's chest plate expanded slightly as he took a deep breath. Turn right at the next corner. His directions led them off the main road and into a slightly marshy area crisscrossed by meandering creeks. The streets turned narrow and winding as they threaded their way through and between the creeks and Lerone noticed that most of the houses were built up as much as a metre above ground level. Apparently, flooding was a constant concern here. There, Mark Ross said, pointing ahead. Where the wall bows out a little and almost touches the edge of the street. Lerone took his foot off the accelerator, letting the speeder truck coast as he peered ahead at the spot framed in his headlights. Not very secure, Quiller commented doubtfully. If your enemies were smart enough to surround the grounds, you'd walk right into their arms. They're supposed to be a heavy, long-range fighter, prepped and hidden in that house over there, Mark Ross said, pointing to a dilapidated house on the far side of the street from the wall. There's also supposed to be a force field tunnel you can activate that will give you safe passage between the wall and the house. I never saw that work, though. What are we going to do about a pass key? Grave asked. We don't need one, Jade said. We're not going in that way. Keep driving, Lerone. I'll tell you where to stop. If we're not going to use it, why did you want me to show it to you? Mark Ross demanded as Lerone continued on past the secret door. Watch your tone, Stormtrooper, Jade warned. We're not going in that way because it'll be the entrance of choice for the conspirators, and I don't want us bumping into them until we're ready. There. That section between the two trees, pull over there. Lerone brought the speeder truck to a halt. Everyone out, Jade ordered, pushing up her own swing-wing door. Give me a perimeter. She strode over to the wall, lightsaber in hand. Lerone had formed the others into a standard, outward-facing guard box formation by the time Brightwater glided his speeder bike back around and came to a halt beside them. What are we doing? he asked. I'm not sure, Lerone admitted, watching Jade out of the corner of his eye. She was leaning against the wall, her hands and one ear pressed against the cold stone. Slowly, methodically, she moved herself in a grid search pattern along and down the surface. We're going in, but I'm not sure exactly how. Quietly and without casualties, Jade said, stepping away from the wall. Ever hear of Chrysifa gas? It's an acidic poison, Brightwater said. Highly corrosive and lethal to most oxygen-breathing species. Very good, Jade tapped a section of the wall. There's a canister of compressed Chrysifa buried in the wall right here. And here, she indicated another spot. And here, and here. Ready to kill anyone who tries to punch through the wall. Lerone murmured, a shiver of disgust running through him. Along with everyone for fifty metres around him, Jade said. A simple, but very undiscriminating weapon. And you can tell where the canisters are? Grave asked. 
Walls like this collect a lot of sun heat during the day, Jade explained, unlimbering her lightsaber. With a sizzling snap hiss, the brilliant magenta blade burst into existence. Stone and metal make different contraction sounds as they cool down. You might want to step back for this. None of the stormtroopers moved. Lifting the lightsaber horizontally, Jade pushed the blade's tip gently into the stone. For a few seconds, she continued to force it straight in, then shifted to a sideways motion, carefully carving out a circle. She finished the circle and shut down the lightsaber. Do you want us to get that out? Larone asked. No need. Lifting a hand toward it, Jade inhaled slowly. And, with a muffled grinding sound of stone on stone, the cylindrical plug she'd carved worked its way out of the wall. Marcross stepped forward and caught the plug as it came free. Nodding her thanks, Jade reactivated her lightsaber and set to work on the next canister. Five minutes later, there were six stone cylinders lying on the ground beside the wall. Is that all? Larone murmured. All we need to worry about, Jade said, turning to face them. Understand me now. When we step inside, this wall will be in enemy territory. If you can get through without killing any of the guards, fine. But if you have to kill, you kill without hesitation. Understood, Larone said for all of them. A minute later, Jade had carved an opening through the safe parts of the wall big enough for them to get through. On the far side, Larone could see some of the garden areas Marcross had described earlier. Commander, Jade invited as she closed down her lightsaber. Deploy your troopers. Larone nodded acknowledgement. Brightwater, you'll swing around toward the main gate, he ordered. I want to know what their security looks like, including how many men they'll have available to draw on when the balloon goes up. Grave, Quilla, you're on flank. Mark Ross, you're on point. You'll lead Jade to your best choice of entrance and get her inside. I'll take rear guard. We close up as soon as Mark Ross gets us in and reform for quiet incursion. Grave, give Brightwater a hand with his speeder bike. Brightwater waddled his speeder bike to the wall, and together he and Grave manoeuvred it through the opening. The scout trooper got on and took off with a subdued whine, heading to the left and the cover of the garden foliage. Grave and Quiller went next, branching to right and left, with Mark Ross behind them. Larone took a step forward. A moment, Commander, Jade murmured, putting a hand on his arm. Sensible policy dictates that the second in command knows what the mission is. Yes, ma'am, Larone said, feeling his heartbeat starting to pick up. Our target is Governor Chord, she said. He's committed high treason, both in conspiring with pirates against Imperial shipping and in sending the reprisal to try and kill me on Geperin. Those crimes have earned him the death penalty. Understood, Larone said, a strange sense of unreality sifting into him like fine desert sand. It was one thing to sit out in space or at a pirate nest and talk about judgment and duty and principle. It was quite another to stand outside the palace of an imperial governor and contemplate his execution in cold blood. Then let's do it, Jade said, shifting her lightsaber to her left hand and drawing her blaster with her right. She slipped through the opening. To defend the Empire and its citizens. Making sure the safety on his E-11 was off, Larone climbed through behind her. And there we have the end of chapter 21 and the end of our episode for this week. All that's left to do is say hello to some folks in the comments. Mike says, hey, it's been ages since I've left a comment, but could you please read uh, Republic Commandos? It's a well-detailed Mandalorian slash Master Chief power fantasy series. I find it addicting to read myself and your quality is unmatched, so please consider. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yes, I certainly will consider. There is a big long list of things to read um, and I'm hoping to do a special one uh, as the next book after I've finished this one. Um, so yeah, but I'd love to get it on there. Um, I suppose one thing that people could uh, say in the comments, for a Republic Commando's voice, because I'm, I'm guessing they're all clones, right? Well, what do we do about the voices? I could try and basically do the Bad Batch, um, or do they all just sound like Temuera Morrison? Or um, what do you guys think? Uh, give me your opinions on that. 
We also have Mac. It's good to see you, Mac. Saying Star Wars Allegiance audiobook is back. Harry defeated the copyright rancor. Um, there, there was, there's no rancor that I'm fighting, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's uh, just, uh, just issues, <laughs> just stuff that I got to manage with. Um, and so we also have. And Rose's Rebel 2377, who says, This is amazing. Perfectly timed for when I head into work. I appreciate all you do. Keep it going. I appreciate you. Workforce represent. I hope work is going well for you. Says, I like the narrative of the stormtroopers. They have an actual moral compass and ethical balance, even if a little heavy handed. I can see what you mean there, but I absolutely agree that I like the fact that we see people within the Empire taking moral decisions and standing up for what they believe is right, not simply following orders. Okay, everyone, that's it from me for now. As always, if you haven't already, please leave a like on the video and do subscribe. When you subscribe, click on the bell so you get all the notifications of when we go live because we do a bunch of live streams. My friend Gilbert is currently playing through the Resident Evil 4 remake and he's having a great time doing it. I'm going to be popping into the streams as and when I can, but I do still have to get some catching up to do um, and also just get myself some free time. But I will see you as soon as I can see you. Until then, my friends, remember that we are all Fulcrum.